You are listening to the Body Charge podcast, and I'm your host, Sandy Sanderson. Welcome to the Body Charge podcast. Today's topic is managing the sensitivity of autistic children. And I have with me special guest, Natalie Palto. Natalie was a frontline healthcare worker for 21 years in diagnostics, so that's CAT scan and x ray. But her son went through a severe nonverbal diagnosis of autism from the age of two, after which she transitioned into the study of multiple nutrition and life coaching, specializing in treating children with severe autism and ADHD. So this is a problem that's um, apparently escalating and the incidence of autism recorded each year is up and up and up. Mm. And, and actually it's not going down. Um, so a few years ago, I remember a uh, talk about, well, that's just because we're getting better at diagnosing it and there's not really that many more, but we've had a lot more years since, and you can't really deny the figures now that they are really reaching exponential proportions. Um, and so there's a lot more research going into the why of it now. And, um, I'm so interested to hear, um, how you got involved in it and what your personal journey has been in in this discovery process and what what um what kind of area do you specialize in in this uh treatment of autism in children cannot wait to share i'll start with my story i think that would probably kind of set the tone um my son at around 2 years old like you said we went through he just wasn't speaking. I ended up in a pediatrician's office after many assessments, uh, thinking I was going in for a speech therapy referral, not even having a clue what I was walking into. And I was what felt like stabbed in the heart and twisted when she told me that she was almost 100% sure that my son had nonverbal uh, autism and that that would be our life. And that I should start making plans for uh, figuring out how we would communicate. And I left there with multiple referrals, but no answers. Now, I was really privileged in a way because I already worked in healthcare. So I didn't have to go and think outside of a box or go through a million assessments to know that that wasn't going to be the answer. And so my thoughts around that were already okay. How do I make this better? And what I, what I mean by better is I thought, how could I give my son the most independence and the best life? And for most people who have nonverbal severe children, like the fear of a child being separated from you and them being found by a stranger and not even being able to tell them who his parents are or his own name or even answer a question is absolutely like, I get chills when I talk about it still because it's so debilitating. It's like a, almost like a PTSD stress response, which I could probably use magnesium for. Yeah, well, you know, when, when people are struck with fear, intense fear, they freeze as well. That's like the rabbit in the headlights, isn't it? Yeah. You, you, it's immobilizing, fear is immobilizing. So it's interesting um, what kind of hormones may be traveling through that child, you know, being afraid there's kind of probably a, a, a negative feedback loop so because they can't speak um, clearly or communicate they become more fearful and that just makes the whole problem worse it does and they they and that is one of the reasons that children really do tend to stick especially autistic individuals tend to really when they're younger hold on to one specific safe person it is their person that they trust and truth be told I was on the, the waiting list for an, I don't know if you've heard this, but it's, a, it's called an AAC machine. This is 10 years ago. This is when this machine was like brand new. This was how my child, they told me could possibly potentially communicate. And my thoughts about that were like, iPads were very new then and social media was new and all these things. And I was like, I don't want my child to speak to me through a machine. I felt like I, like I really felt like I would never get to hear my child speak. I would never hear his voice. And that did something to me when we had that conversation in one of our uh, appointments. And I could tell you like every teacher's appointment, I left crying and I fought and I fought and I tried so hard. And when that one moment where they told me that I may never get to hear my child's voice, that changed something in me that 
really motivated me to have a different circumstance at a times 10 level. So you you re- you rejected that int- intuitively. You knew yeah. never, never is not an option. You knew that there was an, another opportunity, but you just didn't know it yet. And this is probably the side of you that is the diagnostic part because you sensed there's something else to discover, right? Did it make sense to me? And having seen how much healthcare had changed, because I had at this point been in healthcare for 10 years. And when you're in diagnostics and you start to see the rise of chronic illnesses, the way that we did, it was like epidemic proportions. And then all of a sudden autism was this rising number that I had never even met an autistic child. Mind you, I had, if they broke their bone, but that was not a, like a type of person that we x-rayed or that we saw through CAT scan very often because all of, all of the things that were happening are happening internally. It's not the norm, but to, to bring us forward to, to kind of. So you can't give them a scan. You you can't tell if they have autism from a a blood test or a scan. However, however, I do, it's not just behavioral. I do believe that there are, are gut disorders that are always associated with autistic presentations and um tons of data shows that yeah yeah so how did you discover that so i actually was researching on dr google as sad as that is because i had all these medical books to my at my fingertips where i could find nothing helpful and surprisingly enough i actually found a blog from someone who and i was at myself on a a health journey at that time and so i had already molded my mind and was very open to the belief that illness was linked to some form of lifestyle deficiency and when I fell into the world of um, all of it, uh, of Nata- Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride was probably my first touch. Yes, I read her book. Absolutely yeah. awesome. Highly recommend it. She's one of my heroes. Yeah. She's amazing. Yes. Yeah. And the thing, the only thing was, is that I found it very restrictive and I had started on a health journey of nutrition as well. So what we did was something of the sort. And I think that that's where we see a lot of results with, and now I see it with so many other families, but at the time, our journey took about four years, four years of trial and error. And the difference is right now, especially through that. I like that about my journey is that I didn't have anyone to compare myself to. I had a book, I had a blog that, that someone was just sharing a little bit about their journey, not even sharing if they were having results or not, but just sharing this journey that they were in a few recipes. And it was like this shot in the dark, but I knew it, that was the thing. It, it wasn't going to hurt them, right? Like it's health is not going to hurt your child. So just changing I, the diet to something more yeah. healthy. And yeah. my son only ate three foods. So I, so I actually educate a lot on picky eating um, and they were French fries, chicken nuggets from McDonald's and grilled cheeses. So I, if I could overcome picky eating, I always tell people, don't worry, anyone can. So, you know, I, uh, I read, uh, yeah, sorry to interject. I, I did read something recently that those types of foods cause um, metabolic byproducts, which mimic opioids. And they like those type of foods because it's 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 soothing and calming, and it's almost like having a a medication, an opioid medication. It just calms them right down. But then you know the side effect is that they're not nurturing their good microbiome, and right. it creates high levels of acidity, which then bring more bad bugs into the system. <laughs> so on the longer term, it's not very good. It just gives it like a short term hit. And it's a cycle because once you feed your bad bugs, you automatically give them control over what you crave and they run the show. Yeah, they run the show. They tell you what you want to eat, want more sugar. If you've got candida, give me more sugar. And then then if you don't have sugar, then they'll find carbs or they'll find something else uh, that will convert to sugar. It's a, you know, our bodies are so intricately smart. (laughs) (laughs) They are. So for us at around, and this is true. That was the first thing I learned was that, um, and, and of course now there's tons of data that shows that that 91% of children will do well on a gluten-free and uh, casein-free diet. That's huge. And so, and like 91%, that's pretty much almost everyone. Now there are some things with gluten-free products and this is something that was in service to my journey. I usually tell people that like this was a huge service was that those were not available. 
uh, the fact that I had to learn and reevaluate my habits and my life and embrace a whole food lifestyle was in, in service to my journey. And I believe that my son has the results that he did, which in, in this world, he does not have a diagnosis. He is the most social person you'll ever meet. He is academically brilliant. And his teachers always say he's like the leader in the class. Like he will help other students now learn. So now he's more his normal self. That's right. He is. He, well, he's a, he's a self that even now when I like, and I always tell the story of like watching him hang up the Christmas tree, he could put an ornament on the Christmas tree. And I remember the first time he did that, he was actually so severe that he would not even look up to his own name. He had absolutely no knowledge of what happened outside of about a two foot radius from him. And oh. so, and he was set. So he was five and still fully nonverbal, which for a lot of people, and I always like to say this in podcasts specifically is, we we always feel with kids that we're in a race against time. And there was a few studies that came out that said, you know, after five years old, we know that most of the microbiome is has been created. We know that the link between the vagus nerve is not as like the vagus nerve itself is no longer as open between the gut and the brain. And so like I talked to parents and they have this feeling and this fear of a race against time. But we started our journey at five and we were very successful and I'm seeing currently people within my program who are starting their journey at eight and their daughter has already started to make sounds and connection and really starting to show so much improvement in less than two months. So, yes, I've also heard of adults uh, yeah. on the spectrum having a poo transplant, so a fecal yes. transplant, and that completely reverts behaviors and their their gut health, everything normalizes. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, also weight gain, if they if they um, had a, a bad gut, let's call it a bad gut, a di dysbiosis, um, they have a higher propensity to put on weight. They don't process sugars very well and you know, it they la they can't metabolize. Usually, they have very low magnesium if that's the case, because magnesium and sugar are like on a seesaw. So the higher the sugar sensitivity, you know, the lower the magnesium. As you lift magnesium in the body, it, it addresses the sugar sensitivity. Me metabolism can correct itself better and move more to fat burning, um, which is the ideal because it gives us a more sustained energy, um, and uh, everything works better. Uh, with that method if we if we have anaerobic metabolism which is sugar metabolism that produces way too much acid and acid dissolves us over time it really ages us prematurely yeah. so addressing the gut is super important it's like the number one thing to do for your health doesn't matter what the issues may be right it is. And actually, interestingly enough, so is that like, like child brain development. One of my certifications is in child brain development. And you talking about magnesium really makes me think of that because one of the modules that I share with people, which I'm sure you're going to love hearing about because it's, it, it highlights magnesium beautifully, is of course talking about aggression. Aggression and autism and sugar spikes and understanding the nutrients that will support lower sugar spikes and understanding how there is this beautiful... Um, kind of dance that certain nutrients do together that can help lower behavior, like you were saying, specifically our magnesium and zinc, and we have omega-3s, and all of those can completely change outcomes from going to, and so for families who are having and seeing like two to three meltdowns a day that are lasting over 15 minutes and self-harm, this is absolutely debilitating to a family. And so when we start to work with foods and with, again, I, and it's funny because I always recommend either topical application of magnesium or magnesium baths because we know it's better absorbed in the skin. Um, Nothing this is to digest. Huge... Yeah. In a ah. system which finds it difficult to digest, mm -hmm. then you want to lift the load as much as possible. Mm -hmm. so, so here's my here's my take on um, why the autism epidemic is escalating it's that we've had a confluence of different things we've have, have lower magnesium in the soils and therefore the food supply magnesium helps us to be calm and relaxed and low magnesium increases our experience of stress and increases our sensitivity to stress so we have low magnesium playing in and then we have excessive toxins in the environment we have a lot of um, chemicals um, heavy metals, 
uh, what making their way in through food through the air we breathe if we're in a big city so there are lots of ways that we can accumulate toxins and if your gut isn't performing properly you can't detox properly uh, and the, and there is also research genetically to show that um in the, in the majority of cases of people on the spectrum they have a difficulty with their methylation so that's their detox system they can't process wastes very well and so they tend to accumulate and cause more havoc so we've got this confluence of toxins accumulating and then not enough nutrition to counterbalance and then that is not feeding our good microbiome which takes care of our digestion so we can get more good nutrients <laughs> so that's that's, like, that's pretty that's much sums up. yeah it is it is and it's exactly right. It's exactly what's happening in the world right now. And how I like to approach it is we do, because we're also so depleted in multiple different areas with nutrient capacity, it's important to kind of uh, do bioavailability for autistic kids that are, that is very kind of specialized to each one. Uh, nutritional therapy is a great option for that. And then using very specific detoxes that are supportive in a sequence. So supporting the liver, making sure that our, that those kids detox organs are working optimally. And of course we know methylation happens in the liver. So supporting that area first and making sure that all of that, while we're still taking care of the gut to keep it simple though, I usually tell parents, if you can get your kids to really focus um, heavily as well on eating more plants, that's a great way and colorful plants. You are at least feeding the microbiome, supporting a little bit of detoxification intentionally, and you're also uh, creating a very brilliant brain. And fats yeah. are very important, aren't they? Fats, because half the brain is made of cholesterol fat yeah. and the nerve These sheets. Fats are amazing. <laughs> yes, and so it also soothes the gut lining um, and it helps to provide a... Um, uh, the mucosal lining that house our good microbiome that live in that lining so, and so, so um yeah and it's also soothing it's not scratchy because some of them have texture issues don't they they yes like that is huge but it but as um as the chemistry within the body recalibrates even the saliva changes even their taste changes even their uh, reactions and their ability to digest changes wow so yeah it just really starts there so you're creating another biological system from the ground up so what yeah. goes so what so really everything um what what goes in comes out oh what's that computer garbage in garbage out but also <laughs> works the other way good stuff yeah. in good stuff out yeah so we we're really seeing f physics at the most basic level of life we can't cheat nature can we we can't. And honestly, I, and at the end of the day, I always tell people we are, you know, just a sausage casing with like internal organs that contain internal chemistry that contain molecules that are energy that move close together. It's, it's just, we're just this beautiful package, but yes. at the core of it, it's just so, it really gets to the simplicity, the faster you can get to the simplicity of it all, the more that it actually heals the quickest. Yes, and I think it's important to notice these things and to make adjustments during childhood because it does get harder as we get set in our ways as we have now a lot of problems with adults who have autism that were probably never diagnosed. Um, I think I saw statistics that over 40% are in prisons and they, they got there inadvertently not meaning to do something, but not recognizing the world around them, uh, being in dangerous situations or with dangerous people that they didn't realize to be not to be associated with, lot, lots of different reasons. And then um, they, they tend to copy because they, they need socialization, yet they can't have too much of it. There's this like dichotomy of you know, they need love and they need relationship and they need to feel like they fit. And then they don't want to be different, but yet they are different. And so there's this interplay of embracing who they are and not being afraid yeah. of who they are and not just mimicking and copying everything around them because sometimes those behaviors are not good to copy, right? <laughs> yeah. No. And, and again, like when we have high functioning autistic individuals, a lot of them have this beautiful way of thinking that I think there's this thought of like, it's us or them. And I try so hard to mitigate this, this like thing that this 
space that people have placed between high functioning autism and, and severe low functioning. And the truth is, is that our, we want our children and our adults to live the most, you know, beautiful and the life of their dreams, basically. And they have so much they can give. And the truth is, is that we also have to look at that nonverbal severe is not the same as high functioning and that there, if someone who is high functioning feels and is living their best life and is able to, you know, feel good inside, because I, there's so many things associated with high functioning as uh, autism as well with the depression and the mental illness. Yes, like, yeah. ab absolutely. They, they have big problems existing in the world that we have. And a lot of them can't address their constant chronic anxiety. And this mm. then leads them sometimes into alcoholism. Um, yeah. If they if they get introduced to it in a social environment, then they they can learn to self-medicate with alcohol, but and they don't know when to stop, they don't know when the end is. And so then they end up, you know, really harming themselves over time. So so it's it's a good thing to help children learn good habits right from the beginning because even in high functioning autism they can regress depending on their environmental influences their diet or what they eat drink uh, everything affects that microbiome so they can actually go backwards yeah and they can go forwards right and they can go forward it's not fixed um, yeah. <laughs> exactly and i think that once like I, like, for example, like I have a business partner and she has ADHD and the person that I met when she started working with me and she's a physician. And when we decided that, okay, she wanted to embrace nutritional therapy and basically she ran, she put herself through the program that I run for children. She did this on her own, but it had to be on her own choice. Like it had, it really does have to be their choice. But once the, we embrace that, that is a possibility and we begin to feel a little bit better and a little bit better it becomes so much easier as an adult to also compound that. Yes, personal experience is everything. Then you're not just believing something someone says. You yeah. you know it because yeah. it it's happening for you. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can't wait to share it. That's how I felt with magnesium. Um, so yeah. when I uh, after I rescued my own self from from a debilitating health issue I had Hashimoto's hypothyroidism in 2007 and extremely low levels of magnesium and um and heart arrhythmias um and the whole lot uh, regulated itself as soon as I started getting enough magnesium but because my digestive system wasn't working well I had to depend on the transdermal route and it worked so well that I found it um, the um, the brand Electromagnesium. So now we have a whole range of magnesium skincare for all ages, including young children and babies. So we have a lot of mothers who are customers purchasing for their children who have autism because the, ch the children have learned that it makes them feel so good. They get a little gentle massage before bed on the back or the legs and they so love the tube of magnesium cream, they, they actually hide it and then bring it out the next night. It's so cute. It's so cute. But these are like little extra tools. There's no toxic elements in. It's really gentle and um, um, it's just nutrition through the skin. Um, so uh, it's working quite well. And I think that's amazing. I think that um, because magnesium has so many functions throughout the body and because it's so, such a great calmative and if 54% of kids who have autism are also having a hard time sleeping, I couldn't imagine a better thing to put on your child before bed, right? Or before going into it, especially going into an environment, they may feel more triggering for meltdowns. It's like, it's, it's like a powerhouse tool. Well, that's right. So if, even if you just use it before bed to get a better sleep, to get some extra hours, which is good for mum too. <laughs> I highly yeah, recommend it, it for oh mothers. Gosh. The whole family should be dosed up because if right? you can chill well, out your whole family with magnesium, <laughs> your life becomes much better. Yeah, everybody <laughs> sleeps. Mom gets to sleep. <laughs> sleep is everything. It's the best vitamin from sleeping because that's when your brain detoxes itself. So you want to. Yeah. So that's why when you have a deeper sleep, you wake up really refreshed and you feel so good. All your endorphins are are flowing yeah. and. You just feel on top of the world and energetic and everything's good. If we don't get enough sleep, well, that's the opposite. And yeah, you well, your cortisol doesn't run at the same level and it starts to spike at incorrect times. And then your heart rate variability just 
goes tanks down. So yeah, absolutely. Sleep and the circadian clock is 100% one of the pillars of health that we teach about. That's great. So before we finish, would you like to just summarize or give people um, the most important things to consider? Um, if they suspect their child has autism, um, where might they go to get more information or to connect with you? Yeah. So first I'm going to give them a, that this, if you prevention is, they always say it, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound or um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so uh, to find me, it's at www.blueliferx.com, which actually just, we like to share about the blue zones. And if you haven't heard about the blue zones, that is actually an, a very great place to actually start the journey of prevention. And for your kids living in a way that what I teach is lifestyle medicine. It's a combination of six pillars of health and just knowing them and being on top of them is going to prevent what could come and actually help what is. And to the point where you could have the most independent and great child and life for your entire family that you envision. The pillars are very simple. They are sleep, which we were just talking about, getting your <laughs> children, obviously that's really high and get that magnesium on first. Uh, secondly is nutrition. Of course, nutrition is important. We know that it, it has a multi-dimensional purpose in the body by detoxing and feeding the microbiome and building a brilliant brain and helping our organs and everything function optimally. Uh, using movement, we have very sedentary ch uh, children now and they just did a study that shows that screen time of anything over two hours can actually, because of its impact on GABA, can increase the severity of autism. And we have kids who are on there, uh, especially with autism, that will sometimes spend five, seven hours a day on their screens. Wow. Uh, so, and they're yeah, not getting and, enough oxygen then, because if you're not moving your body enough, the brain doesn't get enough oxygen. It can go into hypoxia. So that not only do you get brain fog, but you can become extra sleepy um, and just not focused. Yeah. And then the dopamine is impacted because they're constantly going from one video to the next. We know how social media is absolutely very geared towards addictive. Dopamine. Yes. <laughs> and then the next pillar is actually risky substances, which obviously for children, that looks like toxicity in the environment, being very cautious of understanding what glyphosate is and the things that we're feeding our children, the pathways of toxins, are our skin, our nose and our mouth, what's going in and just taking inventory is what's going in those spaces. Yeah, good or bad. Chem chemical colorings, flavorings, you have to become an avid label reader in the supermarket. Well, <laughs> you can download the Think Dirty app. I am not a sponsor. It's totally free and you can scan your products. It is one of the greatest little apps you can get that will like just be very time efficient if you're starting your journey to just scan your products in your home to know how they rate. So that's a really great tip. Uh, the other ones are relationships. As parents of kids with autism, we tend to think that it's easier to stay inside than to actually socialize because of the possibility of behavior disruption. And the truth is, though, is that that doesn't create the capability for a child to have more adaptability because then we just focus on rigid routines. And that's a totally different part of the brain. And, and so for and autism, yeah. Also, because the autistic presentation is very yeah. self-focused, it's like I am the center of the universe and I don't understand that there's anything outside of me. It's only through social interaction and bouncing off other individuals that we realize I'm over here and they're over there and they're different. And and that's how relationships work. We We need relationships to realize more of who we really are, don't we? And they are, and relationships are 100% linked to longevity. And for yes. severe kids, it's like their lifespan is currently, as studies show, is one that like the life expectancy for someone who's severe, possibly going to be institutionalized is 36 years old. And that to me is not okay. That sounds That's to me like lack of love and being heartbroken yeah. and isolated. We're not meant to be, you know, marooned on an island. And that's what happens. They become, they can become reclusive and that will shorten their lifespan. Uh, and yet they need love. They need that relationship just like everyone else. I don't think that they are like a separate group of people. It's just one big spectrum in the population. It's either more and more autistic or less and less autistic, but it's all one big spectrum. 
it, yeah. it is the population and how it's spread. Yeah. And everybody benefits from the same things in that space, in, especially true. when we think about like lifestyle. Absolutely. And the last one is actually building resilience and giving them the opportunities for um, learning about different situations, not always verbally, but being letting them be curious you know, like nature intends us to, like a mother tiger letting her cub explore a little bit, but still being vigilant, right? There's there's mm -hmm. this capability of pushing. It has to be pull. some fun. Yeah, that's it. Be a child. That is the thing mm -hmm. with a lot of therapies that I don't generally, it's not that I don't, I'm not a fan of therapies. That's not, well, maybe that is actually what I mean. It's, it's more that a lot of therapies become a full-time job for a child and they don't have that opportunity. 40 hours a week, I hear some kids To are, just play. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of breaks my heart a little bit. I'm very happy that I lived in a place that was very nature bound. That's another one nature, right? We know being outside is so, so good for them, but... supports the microbiome. <laughs> yeah, it's all over. I mean, it's everywhere. It's on our skin. It's in our eyeballs. <laughs> it's... Well, but we need to finish on that note, look after your microbiome and then your <laughs> health will take care of itself, right? That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Natalie. It's been really, really interesting talking to you and I'm sure people will get a lot out of it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I absolutely can't wait to get all of your information on these products. Electromagnesium.com.au <laughs> Amazing. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed the video, please share with others. You can also subscribe to our channel to be notified of future videos. To be notified about new blogs and product special offers, please subscribe to our newsletters at electromagnesium.com.au.